Okay, you guys, we're live here on another Google Hangout. Get to hang out with Edward Ford again. How you doing, Edward? I'm I'm pretty well. I'm pretty well. I'm pretty excited about today's uh, uh, Google Hangout. I've been talking to Sonny for a while now, I guess, a couple of years, and this is the first time that I've actually like talked to him as close to face to face as you can. Yes, exactly. And Sonny, good to meet you face to face via yeah, Google Hangout as well. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Good to meet you guys finally. I've kind of been in my own little cave, I guess, like a digital cave for I don't know four years now, coming out of my <laughs> Sunny, we're, right all, we're all in our digital cave, so yeah. you know, we have to occasionally come out and, and do one of these and talk right. like human beings. So, yep. so Sonny, there's a question we're all dying to ask you, and I hope you have the answer. Is it gerbil or gerbil or garble? It depends on who you ask. Uh, <laughs> I asked Simon a long time ago what it was, and he said it was gerbil because... Um, he thought it was like a small little device, like a mouse, and so he kind of extended that to a gerbil. But, you know, in America, gerbil is a kind of, you know, my, my, my wife calls it cute. gerbling. Yeah, well, she calls me, when I'm working on it, she says I'm gerbling, so it's not very good kind of <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so, That's awesome. so I've been officially calling it gerbil for years. Gerbil. Yeah, it's gerbil. And Edward, what do you call it? Yeah, I, you know, I called it garble. Well, first I called it gerbil, and then I called it called it garble, uh, which Simon actually thought was really funny. And uh, then I, I think I don't know what I call it now. I, I think I call it gerbil. <laughs> yeah. I call it I call it gerbil. So here's the problem with garble. It sounds like it'll garble your G code before it submits it to the Arduino processor, and it'll get garbled up. Yeah. Gerbil yeah. has been used in other ways. I don't even <laughs> want to go there, but yeah. let's just all agree right now. You guys ready to agree right now? It's gerbil I, or gerbil. Sorry, it's, it's gerbil. gerbil. It's gerbil. Okay, yeah, I'm down with that until the next time somebody asks me and I forget. Sonny, <laughs> Sonny, you cool with that? I mean, you're the keeper uh, of totally cool the firmware. Your vote matters more than mine. Yeah. So it's what what I, what I want to know, just like right off the jump, just to jump straight into this whole thing, is uh, I was following. So I met Simon online, which actually doesn't sound right at all, but it through some like CNC context, met the guy online. He had just released uh, the initial version, you know, like zero point one or whatever. Uh, Simon was maintaining it. He sort of took a hiatus. And then, Sonny, you just, like, sort of like Batman, when a signal went up, just, like, showed up, and you you were the new maintainer of, of, of Garble. How did that happen? Gerbil. Well, Gerbil. Gerbil. <laughs> um, kind of happened just because of my job, really. Like, um, I moved down to Albuquerque and started working at this uh, research lab, and we make a lot and design a lot of parts, aerospace parts. And um, I befriended the machinist there, who is this absolute genius, CNC genius. And he, he led me down the rabbit hole of CNC, basically. So, so is, is this the machinist that you refer to in your blog as Machinist yes. Mike? Yeah, he's Machinist Mike. Man, um, what a great name. I wish that was my name. <laughs> <laughs> he loves it, too. Yeah. Um, he's, like, a 65-year-old man who makes, like, you know, Aerospace quality parts all, all day long, every day. So he's he's amazing. He's basically um, my hero right now. Yeah, he he's mine too. But don't don't tell him that. Wait, so Sonny, what what you're really <laughs> saying is you're working on like the next nuclear weapon, and you just can't tell us. No, I'm um I do like uh, deployable space space structures. So it's like I don't do anything that's like classified or anything like that. I, I do deployable space structures on a daily basis too. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. just another Tuesday. <laughs> exactly. Just another thing I shot up into space. Cost a billion dollars a launch, but you know. <laughs> no, no big deal. I'm sunny. Make deployable space structures. So, Move on. What, Next. Anyway, um, so when I started down the path of trying to find good CNC, I, I found Edward's blog. And I was like, he, it was the first to really demonstrate that you can actually do something with Arduino and get rid of like the parallel part completely. Like, um, and build a machine, everything from end to end. And uh, 
So I found Gerbil and started working on it, and I thought, oh, maybe in a couple months I could figure it out and get it working. <laughs> yeah. Here I am Classic. four years later still working on it. You know, so. <laughs> Classic last yeah. words. This will, this will only take a couple months. Yeah. So, yeah. Sonny, uh, Edward and I were trying to surmise how many Gerbil uh, devices are out there versus, like, Tiny G's. Well, well, first of all, I, I just want to repreface this because I, I know how right I was in our conversation. John was like, oh, do, like, what, what do you think? There are, like, two times as many? And I was like, eh, 10x or more, Easy, hands down, uh, Gerbil compared to, to Tiny Gerbil. G. There's so many users, but Sunny probably has the actual download stats for the hex files. I have some. I mean, I can't track for the GitHub downloads at all, so um, I couldn't tell you that. But I have a Bitly, uh, like a kind of a tracker on it on the down yeah. for more downloads. But right now, about only 20% of the users in the U.S. are are uh, the downloaders, I guess, and the rest of them are like across the world, like 200 different countries. Mm. It's pretty amazing. Um, yeah. Most of them from the EU and China, from places like U- Uruguay or like Botswana and stuff like places like that. It's pretty amazing. But uh, um, Edward, you might know data even just from uh, the sales of the devices. Uh, yeah, I think that's a better better uh, value because I there's no way I can tell. Yeah, I'll that's stick to my original just like guesstimate of ten to one. Yeah. So okay. I think I think the biggest thing is is that the it's so the it's based on the Arduino Uno, which is so ubiquitous. It's everywhere. It's worldwide, and anyone can like download onto it, uh, try it out, and then if they don't like it, they can take it off. And just about every every hacker, every maker has an Arduino, or you know, several of them. I think yeah. I have like twenty lying around my basement office right now. Exactly. So I I just found one in my pocket. <laughs> Here, here's one. Here's one right here, just sitting right in front of me. There yeah. you go. Yeah, they're all over. Yeah, they're everywhere. They're like they're like gerbils running around my uh, office. <laughs> they're my couch cushions. Okay, so um, I've got a little uh, treat to show you, and I'm gonna ask. Wait, you a wait, hold, hold up. I I wanted to, to hear the the end of the the question. So so how how did you get to be the maintainer? I started writing, and uh, Simon seemed like he wasn't updating it. And then he kind of looked at my code and said, "Okay, you need a new maintainer." That's it. That and was I, it. That was it. Yeah, that was it. You didn't have to like arm wrestle him or have like a code off for it. <laughs> no, I think he was done. He was like, uh, I think he was moving on to other projects for his work. So like, he just kind of dropped it at that point. And he, he saw was that. busy launching stuff into outer space. <laughs> yeah, no big deal. Yeah. No big deal. Okay, so what I'm wondering, um, and and Sonny, I don't know if you know this, but what do you know if a lot of people are upgrading their firmware? Because I don't know. I, I bought mine. I bought the Edwards Shape Oco before the whole Inventable thing, and I still have it. And I bought the the Gerbil, um, you know, ready to go Arduino, and I've never touched it. I've never upgraded it, uh, and I feel like a lot of people haven't upgraded. That's uh, a shame, because <laughs> there's been a lot of uh, updates since then and uh, vast improvements. So, um, so I think John, the version that would have shipped with with your machine, just like off the top of my head, would have been like 0.7 something. Um, when Inventable started shipping, I think that those were 0.8C. I think the majority of those, even to today, they're still shipping with 8C. Uh, there's a huge difference between 7 and 8C. You should do yourself a favor and upgrade that firmware. I would love to. Now, wait, what's the command, Sonny, to, or Edward, to get the firmware version? Uh, you know, the older one... Sonny, what, when did you start putting the version in? Oh, actually, it's been there from the jump. So just dollar sign. So I just did a dollar sign. You guys are probably seeing my screen, and it just spit out the results. What, what version am I? Very top line. Uh, just hit reset on the Arduino, and then it'll be like one of the welcome message. Uh, reset. Okay. There goes John. <laughs> I told you to stay in the basement.
Uh, oh my god, that's just not gonna happen. It's it's underneath the G shield, so you gotta stick your finger in there. It won't bite. You know what? I'm gonna have to yank the. Uh, well, wait. What if or I disconnect can, the serial cord and reconnect? Yeah. Will that no, redo it? No, do oh, it. Yeah, right there. Zero point eight a. Eight a. Yeah, you seen that? So is that yeah, pretty ancient? Uh, I, I would still I would still upgrade. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've just yeah, been they, talking to other folks about trying to get uh the chili pepper going with with, with Gerbil. And um, a lot of people are like, no, 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 I, I don't want to upgrade. It's too hard or it's too scary. So It's probably too hmm. scary for them. You know, if you've never flashed a hex before, maybe, I don't know, maybe it seems scary. Uh, it would be pretty easy to do a video showing them how to do it, though. I think the reason why is that you... Um you get people used to using the Arduino IDE and just hitting, you know, the run, and it auto uploads. But when you're doing a hex file, it's a, just a different process. Yeah, um, we were. I was looking at trying to do it through the IDE, and for some reason, the IDE compiles Gerbil strangely. It makes it bigger, and uh, I haven't fully tested it yet. But we can do it. It's not. It's not possible. Well, because I think that some of the new stuff, like the probing that's added in um, point nine, is mm -hmm. pretty awesome. So yeah. I'm kind of curious what drove you to go add the probing, uh, because it's exciting. Um, it was Rob Jazarek, or however you say his name. I'm sorry, Rob, if I if you're watching this, um, he I threw Edward. He contacted me, and they started a Kickstarter recently. I don't know if you saw it. It's a Carbide 3D Nomad 883, I think. Um, but it's That's like a, a heck of a name. Yeah, it is. It basically is an end-to-end -end machine. So he developed MeshCam, and he's doing um, all you have to have is a model. You import it to MeshCam. He takes it from MeshCam to his own controller. He uses Gerbil and runs his machine. So you basically have to do nothing. It's like it's basically the 3D printer of, of CNC. That's what he's trying to do. He ended up closing at a half a million dollars. So it's the Nomad CNC mill? Yep. Are you guys seeing my screen? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Looks like the top. Yeah. Okay, sweet. Oh, you yeah, know what? So right, I saw this. This was... Yeah. Um, when, when did this close? Just recently, around Make, Maker Fair. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, May 30th. Okay. So he um, he was actually using TinyG before and trying to get it to work, but he was running into a lot of problems, and he ended up talk, talking to me. He just wanted to add a few things like probing and some other you know, variable spindle rate, all that kind of stuff, and that's how it ended <laughs> up in there. That's sweet. You know what's funny is the TinyG, it was because the other mill guys were pushing for the probing because of the other mill being for um, doing PCBs, which is kind of my passion. And so it is interesting when you get like, a, and the, both of those were Kickstarter projects. So I'd love Kickstarter for pushing the edge and all this open source stuff. Yeah. That's sweet. Um, so I wanted to show you guys, unless Edward, you had some other questions prior to this. No. I take the silence as no. You drop out. I don't know. No, he's still there. Edward, you still there? Edward. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll keep chugging here. I still see him on the Hangout. So um, let me close this. But the um, what I wanted to show, sorry about the little screen uh, disappearing. So, you know, in launching this Chili Pepper stuff uh, for Tiny G, because that's the, the device I'm using most, uh, there's been a lot of feedback to go get it going with Gerbil, and so there's a guy named um, Jarrett Luft that went and uh, did the whole forking, you know, technique where you you fork the boot script, you fork the workspace. So he's actually got it working here, and I just want to show it really quick. It's not completely done, and so I'm curious your feedback, um, Sonny. But this is um, I've got a video, little video window of my uh, Gerbil. Device, you can kind of see it there. It's a little small, yeah. But it's the um, sorry. Let's make that a little wider. It's um, 
it's uh, the G Shield, and then it's uh, it's like G Shield V4, so it's a little old. And then let's just do this. I'll just do some really simple stuff, but ultimately, if I'm, you know, I don't know if you're hearing that. Yeah, I can hear it. It here. We'll, we'll even. We might get feedback, but. So you know, it's doing it. Sorry, we'll mute that because I don't want to get the, the feedback. Um, <clears throat> and so it's working. Um, and you know, the cool part is, so, but he's got all sort of the buffering. I don't know if you wrote that Python buffering script. Um, yeah. That comes that's on your GitHub. But yeah. you know, sort of an attempt to mimic that. You kind of see the the buffer and everything. So it it's pretty close to working. Uh, and so I'm getting excited about it just because so much of the community um, loves loves that device. So I'm just kind of jogging it a little bit here, you know. And, and I think some of the issues are just running into these um, the the whole buffering. The buffering is such a challenge in this stuff. Yeah, in uh, point nine, we we um, I, I solved a lot of the problems. So you can like just you can hammer the crap out of it, and it'll still be stable. Um, I think it's be it would be worth it for you to to install the the edge branch because it's really close to finalizing. I think there's a couple of things I want to add before I release it. Yeah, and so that's that is why I want to go do the upgrade too, um, to to go and, and play around and almost sort of do some testing to make sure that it works great. Um, it, tell me this: one of the challenges we're running into is getting the X Y Z values to reflect where the um, shape oak was actually at. Uh, is the later firmware reporting back the position? I thought I read that it does. Yeah, it does. It, it re reports real time. It take it takes it. Um, there's no lag or anything. It sh there shouldn't be at least. Yeah. Okay. But the the zero point eight I'm running just doesn't report back position. Is that? It should. If you hit a question mark, it should reply back a, oh. a position. Okay. Well, maybe that was all we need. Edward, it sounds like you're back with us. I'm back. I'm back. My phone actually overheated. No joke. Shut Holy itself shit. off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm using it as a hotspot right now, so it's pretty hot. No worries. I've, like, wrapped it around a piece of maker slide to act as a heat sink. <laughs> nice. I, I think it's going to do a better job at dissipating the heat. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, that's hilarious. Okay, well, so um, so actually, you're right, uh, uh, Sonny. I just do the question mark, and there's my position. So, um, is it would it be the case then to just query that every now and then, or does it auto report that back? No, only when you send the question mark, it'll, it'll report back to you. And it's asynchronous; you can do it anytime you want. <clears throat> Very cool. And then um, your so the could, feed hold. Oh, go ahead. Could, could you just could you just this? Could you just pound it with with question marks, just like you know, as fast as you can send them, or is it gonna at, at some point in time is there gonna be an issue? Yeah, if you keep on doing that, um, you will you kind of kind of delay the other processes like you know parsing and you know setting up the planner and all that stuff. So eventually you'll hit a threshold before it breaks. Um, but for the most part, um, at least with 0.9, like you can hammer it pretty good. You know, you can get refresh rates of anywhere from 10 to 20 hertz, probably. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty awesome, actually. Um, well, good. So that's a that's a path forward there. I think uh, I think that's going to be great. And then, um, you know, I, I heard Jared actually ran like a whole uh, job on the um, the the gerbil uh, through this. Uh, yesterday, so get, making good progress. So I'm excited about it. So I missed a little bit. I, I'm assuming that this is the Gerbil specific <laughs> workspace. Yeah. So uh, notice it's just this Jarrett. So remember Edward in our last video, I kind of painstakingly showed you how to fork it. You're probably bored stiff. Yeah. Um, I actually f I fell asleep for a couple seconds. I wondered what had happened. Yeah, well, you know, us, us software nerds, we get all excited <laughs> looking at code. You're like, a hardware guy, you're like, boring, can I gouge my eyes out? Boring. Um, no, yeah, so what I was showing, Edward, is uh, I'm actually sending command. Oh, well, yeah, now it's not working. Of course, when you go to look. Um, I, do, I, just, I do see your new access layout. That looks pretty nice. Yeah, it's, uh, 
you know, and there's this is actually the older one that Jarrett's doing, um, which is part of the problem of all this forking. The the new Tiny G one's got a whole new axes thing going. Not, but you know, what the heck? Now I'm not getting. It's not processing my jog commands. So. Oh. Uh, yeah. Sometimes the old version of Kerbal can do that. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, here, here. Let's do point that. Point I should be uh, should should solve that. There we go. Oh man, what's going on? Oh wow, that's why it's this is still in beta. Um, but yeah, I I went and fired up the whole uh, machine just for you. Let me hit reload because it is pretty cool to see this go. I'm almost tempted to run this whole <clears throat> PCB uh, milling job while you guys sit here as as like a backdrop, you know, like in the is that the is that the single sided Arduino clone? That is. That's the uh, like that red colored. I don't even yeah. remember who I bought that from. Were you selling that thing? No. It was if it was red. I mean, I'm assuming you'd know if it was SparkFun. Otherwise, it would probably be um, Seed. Yeah, no, maybe maybe it was Seed. Uh, it's either Seed or it's ITed. It's probably ITed actually. Yeah. Yeah, I've bought a lot of stuff from Seed and IT Studio. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's actually running. Uh, I don't know if you're hearing it there, but you can kind of see the lights blinking and the x-axis moving. So it's, it's cool. I'm excited about it. Some nice jogging. <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> so back to the back to the video. Um, so what are some of the next steps for this uh for for, uh, for Gerbil. Um, so um, there are a few remaining things that you really need for like a professional quality um, uh, controller, and namely these are like the feed rate overrides. And so you can actually on the fly, real time, change the feed if it's cutting too slow or cutting too fast. Yeah. Or the spindle rate or the coolant. Um, it was actually really difficult to figure this out, and I think I have, and I pretty much have like the layout set up, and I think I need, I wanted to get version 0.9 out before I actually start working on it because I think I, it's just another um, deep hole that might be, I don't know, there might be some gap gotchas in it, but um, I think this will be the first one, first one of these uh, microcontrollers based control uh scenes controllers that will actually ha be able to do that well and not like some kind of like hackery job of um kind of changing them on the fly with the G code coming in uh, and you have to kind of wait until the buffer empties do you think um, that you're out of um, room on the the uno to do anything more and that you really oh, yeah. have to use the new device <laughs> yeah it, most definitely i mean it's like it's been an interesting problem because you're so <laughs> space constrained, so memory constrained. You ha it forces you to be really, really efficient in what you do, and so it would, it's actually a good thing, for, I think, for the community because then you end up with this like really concise code that you can take anywhere, and that's kind of what has happened with Marlin and even Tiny G. Like uh, Alden and I kind of uh, developed everything in parallel up to a certain point, and he kind of went off and did his own thing. Um, but yeah, I forgot where I was going. Well, I mean, do you think? But there's some new Arduino um, devices coming out. But then, of course, we've got the Raspberry Pi. We've got the the Beagle Bone Black, uh, which so, is getting rave reviews. So, like, where does all this go? So, one of the problems with the Raspberry Pi and Beagle Bone is the EMC2 problem. Um, they integrate everything, and in, and you have to deal with a real time OS. Um, because they are running both Linux on the BeagleBone and the Raspberry Pi. And that's really hard to manage everything every time. And they have to create, like, you know, their own kernel or something or their own distribution of Linux every single time they want to do a release. <clears throat> Whereas Gerbil and these simple microcontrollers, all they do is interpret and move separators, and that's nothing else. And so you have you can actually get a much cleaner pulse um, and more stable pulse rate, uh, pulse output than you would in um, something that's based in Linux. But, so uh, I, but I, I, I think that the next, uh, beyond this, you know, what's really exciting is they have like the new Arduino Zero coming out that was just announced at this last Maker Fair in San Francisco. And it's based on a M0 ARM Cortex. 
Um, and it's plenty fast enough. And I think at that point we can, you know, start opening the gates. We can start, you know, we can. We've been holding back a lot because we ran out of space. And I think everything's ready, almost just about ready to just kind of explode. Now, Edward, you've you've done a bunch of stuff with BeagleBone Black with um, the EMC two, which is now called um, what Linux, Linux EMC. EMC. Yeah. Um, you know, so what's kind of your take on it? Um, Linux CNC on a straight up PC, you know, running it off of a parallel port, it is really nice. It was my introduction to, you know, PC based CNC controllers. So it's sort of like the benchmark that I have in my head. Um, the two things that it has that Sonny mentioned earlier that Garble doesn't have, Gerbil doesn't have, is a uh, feed rate override on the fly. And it's it's such a once you have it. Uh, it's such a thing not to have. Like, you, you get so used to, you know, you start the job, oh, it's running a little bit too fast, you can kind of slow it down. Oh, wait, I can run faster than that. You speed it up again. It's so nice to be able to vary it as you go. Um, that's one of the features that, that's that's missing from Garble. But... Gerbil. Gerbil. But the one on the, on the BeagleBone Black, uh, it's not as... It's, it's really nice, um, but it's not as sort of butter smooth as the one from the PC. So I, I think uh, Charles is the guy who maintains it. I'm blanking on his last name right now, uh, the machine kit image. It, it's, it's pretty slick, but it's got a little bit to go. Um, as far as the Raspberry Pi go, goes, I actually don't know if there's any chance of getting a real-time OS on it. For some reason, I think that I read that that's actually not possible. So with the Raspberry Pi, I'm pretty sure that you always need some off-board step generation. Yeah, and it's interesting because I feel like price point is such a big deal. You know, that whole 10 to 1 ratio of Gerbil to Tiny G, I think price point's a huge issue. And, and so every $5 or $10 really matters in this sort of weekend project maker community that we're all kind of, you know, playing in. Um, so then I, I think, like Raspberry Pi, the price point's amazing. The BeagleBone Black price point's a little bit more, but not bad at all. Aren't uh, they basically the same price? We, we talked about this before, and I actually forgot to look it up, but a Raspberry Pi is how much? I think it's $35, and the BeagleBone's yeah, $45. Raspberry Pi from Adafruit is 40 bucks. That's because they charge the Adafruit tax. BeagleBone Black looks like you can get it for 55 So, yeah, you got a $15 price difference there. And, and Sonny, do you know if that newly announced Arduino is the same price point as, like, the Uno? They didn't, they didn't release that. Hmm, okay. But I would assume that it would be, because they do weigh is, what, like, $45 or $50? Yeah, Dewey and Dewey's right in between. I think the the BeagleBone and the the Raspi. I actually have a Yoon that uh, somebody somebody hacked together. Uh, somebody on the Shapeoko forum hacked together like a, a server, uh, Gerbil server based off the Yoon. Um, I bought the Yoon. I haven't had a chance to put his firmware on it, but looks kind of cool. Well, so I think partly why I'm kind of asking about where the, the Gerbil stuff goes is that I, I feel like the 3D printing communities really had this huge rallying, and the CNC community's sort of been not quite as exciting, but I almost feel like there's more that can be done. Like, I'm just craving this XYZ controlling of my universe, which Edward has helped me achieve through Shape Oko, the Gerbil, the Tiny G. But I want to now go beyond that. I want to do extra things with the CNC machine to kind of control my universe down at the micron level. So if you think about PCBs, you want to do stuff like apply solder paste at exact positions. You want to do your, 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 your pick and place to put components at the exact position. I want to merge it with um, machine vision. Um, you know, And that's where the probing that the Tiny G and Gerbil just recently added is going beyond the XYZ information or control and sort of this more of a feedback loop. So, you know, it's like how do we do even more with uh, our hardware? Because we're just well, sort of scratching the surface here. Well, look at, well, um, 
just just from like taking the experience from my work, you can't really physically cut or mill anything below a tenth ounce of an inch. So it'd be zero 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 one. Um, it's just simply the, the even surface uh, like imperfections of just uh, like a flat surface of paper. It's like on order of a hundred microns. So um, to try to get even below that, that's uh, that's it's, it's purely the mechanics and the accuracy of the machine and the hardware itself rather than the controller. Okay, so I, I'm with you. When I say micron, I guess I probably mean more like 100 microns or 50 microns of, of sort of capability. Because if you're doing, um, if you're trying to do a PCB and you want, you know, even like an 8 mil trace, right, that's like, um, I don't know, how many, uh, how many microns is that? I think it's... Uh, yeah, no, Wait, are good. we talking about micrometers? Well, <clears throat> microns meaning 100 microns is 0.1 of a millimeter. Okay. Yeah. Most of the stuff that I work in are inches, just because the old school guys were all working inches still. God, you know what? I can't stand working in inches anymore. <laughs> it's just <laughs> it's so antiquated. I can't stand it. Yeah. <laughs> so, it is, it is kind of doing... interesting, though, because you talk to any, any machinist in the world, and... They all want inches. Uh, Maybe not in the world. You talk to any machinist in the U.S. The US. and they, they they all want inches. Yeah. Okay. Because they started doing the profession before the internet, and then they didn't have exposure to the global marketplace. But go on eBay and try and buy end mills in inches off of like all these places in Shenzhen and Hong Kong. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> and so I, you know, I sort of I spent a ton of time on eBay sourcing parts. And it's all millimeters. <laughs> so what are you going to do? But, you know, when you're making circuit boards, you, you can dump out your G-coded millimeters, but then it, things are measured in mils, which is actually an inch metric. Uh, so yeah. so anyway. to, to the point of your question, John, I, I, uh, I don't know what Sonny thinks about this, but I, I'm really a big fan of uh, sort of focusing on one thing and, you know, working with the constraints you have. Um, and making it perfect. So whenever you and I have talked about, um, you know, doing something extra, like with your your solar paste or whatever the case may be, my my like very first thing is add something else to the mix. Instead of having this board that does like, you know, it wants to be everything to everyone. I would want you know this board to control the machine and then a board to do something extra, and then you're talking about machine vision, like a board to do that, you know, so it's like very modular, very straightforward as to what you need to add the functionality that you're after. Um, thinking about making this like all-in-one, you know, sort of controller, like, I don't know, j just seems like it would turn off so many people that uh, it, it doesn't really seem viable to me. Okay, so I, I totally agree with you, uh, Edward, because I think that <clears throat> you need sort of specialized stuff. And so if you kind of look at my first stab at machine vision here, if you're seeing the screen, mm -hmm. these are video feeds of my CNC um, machine. And actually, there's, there's a couple here. Um, and, and so really to get these video feeds, I actually am using two other computers along with the Tiny G. And that's to just kind of get enough processing power to compress it on the fly and then send it down to the main controller. Mm -hmm. And so in a way, I am using multiple devices to kind of pull it all together. But I show this because, um, you know, in a way, I don't know if you can see this here, but I've got the 3D viewer that's in Chili Pepper projecting one of those video feeds right now. And oh, yeah. The idea cool. is that this is the video feed under the tool head. Um, and if you're trying to find a registration position, I mean, really what I should do here is get the, the lower left and the lower right. So these are little eBay USB microscopes mm -hmm. that are just hanging off the spindle. So this is the lower left and this is the lower right. Of course, that's the little, um, you know, for doing the probing. Um, but and then that's like a front view. So the, the thing is, 
can you take something like that's kind of the goal of chili peppers like the glue to bring all this craziness together and if Gerbil did not do a probe I was just gonna go show people how to do a probe through an Arduino on their own and have it merged through just connecting to a different serial port so if you look at um, like that's the hope right like who cares if it's multiple devices and multiple serial ports why not just have it all merged in a software layer like this um, so I'm going back to the tiny G one to you know to sort of disconnect and and Edward you and I talked about this in the last uh, video a little bit so I got me to go scan my network for my serial port servers so right. the the dot ten was what the girl was on uh, the dot seven is um, got the tiny G but then this is like another little custom Arduino board that you can do your own stuff and then maybe you're just writing a macro to do all the interaction or, or who knows so I, I feel like we, that's where we could head and you're right maybe it, did it make sense to add probing into the um, into Gerbil or are what you say so. it's not worth it yeah. no well probing seems like a, a native function of, of a controller um, I think that that's something that you you would sort of expect to find where when we're talking about machine vision, um, I just in my head the, the way I've separated all the functionality, that doesn't seem like something that would come with a controller necessarily. Maybe as, as a plug-in to the controller, but but not, you know, like purely uh, controller proper territory. Okay, so you know, what if what if you start to get sort of this community of people creating add-ons? Like, one of the things I talked to you a while about, back about, Edward, was the, like, a quick release attachment to the Z-axis to pop off your spindle, pop on a laser, or pop on a pick-and-place, and kind of make it more modular, um, because there's so much you can do with it, but I find it really hard to swap those things in and out. So then it's like, well, do I just start trying to add them all at one <laughs> monolithic huge thing hanging off the Z-axis? Yeah, and that, that was one of the things, you know, we talked last time about, you know, a couple of years ago, that seemed like, oh, man, swappable heads, it, it would be so great. But, again, like you're optimizing for totally different things in the machine that at this point, in at least Shapeoko's project, it's like, well... Sort of pick pick one, you know. Yeah, you can't have your cake and eat it too. No, sorry, I'm screwing that up. <laughs> I thought it's... it was a fire drill. <laughs> sorry, okay. It's it's because Sonny said you can't have your cake and eat it too, and my computer freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> so, right. hey, speaking of, of computers, uh. John and I were talking about this last time. So John is a notoriously a Windows guy, which I always kind of want to laugh at him about. Um, although I'm really not a whole lot better. I'm probably like 50-50 between the two. Sonny, what what do you use to develop uh, to develop with? Purely Macs and just a straight text editor. I don't use IDs. What's yeah. your text editor? Uh, text Wrangler, if you want. one. But that's because uh, you're I, writing I, stuff in C, right? Yeah, Street C, so it's not very big. I'm not dealing with, like, you know, millions of lines of code. It's, like, a few thousand. Yeah. You know, Edward, the reason uh, I, I sort of have this hatred for Apple is uh, I don't want to pay the Apple tax or the Steve Jobs tax, and I don't want to be locked in to the Steve Jobs view of the universe. Um, I actually... <laughs> I actually didn't know that you had a hatred for Apple. I thought that you just didn't use it. I mean, you've, you've gone like a whole a whole other I, level right here. I, 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 there is something a little bit weird that makes me just not... Yeah, I, I have this thing against it, although I will still always walk into the Apple store and gawk. So I don't really hate it, but there's certain <laughs> things about it that just bother the crap out of me. The, the funny thing is, I run... Uh, I, I use a, a MacBook Pro, and I joke seriously all the time that Windows runs better on my MacBook Pro than uh, using Boot Camp than, <laughs> than it does on so... any other laptop I've ever used. Yeah, and then, of course, I've got guys at the office with their MacBooks, and they run uh, Windows on it so they can do stuff like PowerPoint, and it's hilarious. I'm like, why, are yeah. you, why do you have a Mac then? Yeah. 
Well, if I didn't have a Mac, they they wouldn't let me in to a lot of places, you know, like Maker Fair. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. And when when uh, when you're pitching VCs in Silicon Valley, they only have Mac connectors to their projector or their flat screen, so it's pretty <laughs> funny. Nice. So now I just carry a Chromecast with me and I shove it into their HDMI port. Nice. That sounded a lot more perverse than it should have, actually. <laughs> that's just because <laughs> you got to find Edward. Yeah, it's just, that's true. Fact. Um, okay, so uh, so Sonny, uh, you know, the, you've get, given us some interesting answers. I mean, what what would you kind of like to see the community do out there that that kind of gets you excited that you think might be some some years off, but maybe who knows? Well, I, I haven't really followed exactly what everyone's doing, but my my um, general understanding of everything is there's a lot of okay things out there um, in terms of interface front front ends. Um, they're all missing something. They're incomplete. They do some do some do things well, some not. And everyone's repeating the same thing over and over again. So there's you got all these like Gerbil senders and you know universal G code sender and all this other stuff coming out. And no one's really it's focusing. Damn chili pepper thing. It's just repeating yeah. everything else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I think you're onto really something really good because if you can do everything modular, set up the structure of being able to plug in you know, little modules into this, this structure, then um, people can start focusing their efforts onto one thing. And because, like, there's there's a kind of a, a dearth of, or a lack of really good programmers that have the time to work on something like this. And, you know, there's, but there are a whole bunch of hobbyists that can, that can program pretty well. Um, so I think we need to structure things so that we can use that resource in a way that um, that will help everyone. that makes sense? So it does make sense because um, that was the goal. First of all, I'm just a hobbyist too. There's just like a weekend project. I always joke that some people like to play golf on weekends. Some people like to fiddle with their shape Oko. Thanks, Edward. Yep. Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks, Edward. So no you know, now I'm a fiddler with my shape Oko. Okay, so... Um, but. But Chili Pepper, take that project I showed you for, for Gerbil. Jarrett Luft is just some guy up in Edmonton, uh, Canada, that whipped up. He's, he saw the probing, the auto leveler that I did, so you can auto level your PCB. And he's like, oh, my God, i got to have it. But I got a Gerbil. And he went and he forked everything, and boom, three days later, we've got ourselves a, a version. That if you awesome. tried doing that with Mach 3, good luck. If you tried doing that with Universal G-Code Sender, good luck. You know, and I think Universal G Code Center is awesome. So, you know, but it's just it's more of this notion of an operating system. Mm -hmm. um, and and will we get more of that? And so, will we get some cool extensions? And it's embracing the fact that the browser is now a better operating system than Windows or Mac, which is why my hatred for Apple doesn't matter, Edward, because the OS <laughs> doesn't matter. The browser is the new OS. Well, I have one stipulation though. Like, oh. I think we really have to consider that you know anybody that's not using, who are who is using these things outside the U.S. They don't really have a lot of money for anything really fast usually. So I think it's very important to at least at a minimum so make sure everything works on the Raspberry Pi, and plus so like Beagle Bones like the next step up, you know, old laptops or whatever. Um, as long as we can do that, I think we'll be all right. Yeah, oh, man. So that that would kill. That would kill the, the approach I'm taking on Chili Pepper because I'm pushing the living daylights out of the CPU on that thing. <laughs> What's the minimum requirements for it? Uh, <laughs> a modern modern C, uh, PC? Yeah, yeah it, it's got to be modern because that the 3D viewer it only works with a GPU. If you try and use an old PC that's doing software rendering, it's just not. It's, it actually works, but it's not great. But now, if you go and turn on that um, video client inside uh, Chili Pepper now, that just starts, if you don't have a good GPU, if you have a good GPU, it uses up another 5% of your CPU. If you don't have a good one, it's going to use up 80% of your CPU to show those video streams. So, But then rendering it into the 3D viewer like I just showed you guys, it's game over. Yeah. So, well, couldn't you couldn't you make still take the modularity of it and be able to remove those parts and plug in something that's a little bit less intensive? Absolutely. In fact, what you can do is just remove it from the workspace and just don't use that feature. If you don't have hardware powerful enough to run it, just drop it off. 
And if you can't turn it off, you could just fork, you know, the the chili pepper stuff and remove it. Right. So you could end up with somebody who creates like the lightweight version of the, the implementation for like a Raspberry Pi. But but when you say that, it reminds me of I I keep hearing from folks like, can you make an offline version? And frankly, I don't want to make an offline version. I think if somebody else does, that's fine. But how do you store the data up in the cloud? How do you do video? Um, you know, where you've got server and client. How do you interact with things like JS Cut? If you're disconnected from the internet, you just lost huge value out of the modern lives we all live. So yeah, but not, not everyone, really interested well, in it. Well, not everyone lives that modern life, and plus, you know. Everyone uses sneaker net, you know, basically like taking a USB stick and sticking it into their, yeah. their machine in the garage, basically. And you know, I have a, a big problem with uh, connecting my nice MacBook Pro to my machine that I just put together, and like not exactly sure if I did all the electronic wiring correctly and not frying the USB port and frying the, the motherboard <laughs> for some reason. And I think that's a valid concern for a lot of people, and so. I think having I think that's why a lot of people use the offline or old computers or anything like that or Raspberry Pis. That's one reason I do at least. Well, but you you know you're sort of saying okay maybe they don't have the best computer or they're not living this modern lifestyle. Why do they have a Shape Oco sitting in their garage then? Not everyone does. I mean, some people just build their own out of wood or whatever. Yeah, that's that's a that's a fact. You know, I really like. Uh, I really like the idea of an offline version of Chili Pepper. Um, I have access to all modern amenities, and I, I still use a USB stick. So that's, I mean, it's interesting, but in a way, I want to change both of your minds. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, we should do another Hangout where I'm controlling three of Edward's machines uh, over in, um, you're what, you're in Illinois? Yeah, uh, from Seattle, and and we're making music, you know, across the country, and you know, maybe. But but here's the thing, okay. I mean, what's the real value in that, though? Okay, but you remember uh, we used to have to buy a server, put it in our server closet to host a website, and now you just buy it in the cloud. Will CNC machines move to the cloud? You there has to be an operator. You can't you can't just you can't just leave it. That's the problem. Someone has to be there. With with a printer, you know, to to some degree, uh, I think that you can, you know, push jobs to a printer, figure out some way to load and unload. I, I can actually sort of easily think of a, a couple of ways to do that that don't involve a conveyor belt that MakerBot tries to do. Um, but as far as a CNC machine, uh oh, uh oh, did we lose Edward? I think he's phone overheated again. <laughs> Probably. He'll come back. He'll put some. He'll blow on it a little bit. <laughs> I I know it's pretty hot in that part of the country right now. I'm pretty humid. Oh, I think oh, he's back. I'm back. <laughs> I'm back. As far as the CNC machine goes, it's you know, just like Sonny said, you have to have somebody right there, um, to load, yeah. unload the part, probably touch off, and yeah, blow off chips, apply oil. Change the tool. There's, there's all, all these other. Okay, things. so what if, what if there's some people running around a big warehouse, oiling crap up, um, but for the most part, you're actually able to do most of the, your work on your own. I don't want to, you know, never say never. Yeah, I'm, but, I'm not, I'm not totally against it, but I think like it is, it's good to have the option of to cater to like the, the traditional way of doing things. Yeah, yeah and. and I, I also think, you know, the, the big reason that, that most of us are, are probably here right now is because people have found, like, the joy of making their own shit. So to say, hey, I actually want to go away from that, it seems like kind of the opposite direction of, uh, of the way that, the, like, movement is going right now. So I want to I wanna ask you, and it's kind of along these lines, but I don't know if you guys are seeing this. And, Edward, I may have talked to you about this before. And this is a stepper motor with a yeah. little... The encoder? Uh, yeah, this is an encoder. And um, I've got, you, know, you were talking about going to OSH Park, right? So I've got my little OSH Park. You kind of make out where the copper is underneath that purple. Sure. Yep, I see it. It's basically the same shape you got here. Yeah. But I've got these little um, sensors, okay? These are little, 
inductor. These are these are just PCB coils, okay? They're are those from, from TI? These are. These are from Texas Instruments. These are off the eval boards that you get yeah. for the LDC 1000. And um, it's funny because, you know, the little acrylic piece that I'm trying to stick this into was milled on my Shape Oco with my tiny G. You know, so I've got this nice little accurate thing. But it's got two positions. So what what it does, and then this is, this is kind of the fun part. Let's see if you can see it. Is that a microscope, John? That, that is. That is a <laughs> microscope. I don't mess around. No. Oh, you it's don't. It's a handbook of technology, man. So this is a shield in an Arduino that is another little OSH Park project. But it did it starts out always with milling on the PCB or on, on the shape of to kind of prototype it. It's got 16 channels of inductance sensing on it to do position sensing. So the idea is that you have two two channels being chewed up for the x-axis, two on the y, two on the z. Uh, you could then also create stepper motor chew up two more channels. So you can, you can do a whole shape of it. But the point, you what you end up with is a machine that better knows its position rather than just always counting steps, which is which works. And most of these old school machinists will say, you should never need to know, you should never need encoders, you should never really need to know the position. I think that's fine. I get that. But if your machine knows its position, could you change the way you do stuff? Could you oh, yeah. move to servos, for instance? Oh, yeah. Servos is the next motor. steps. Uh, you just need um, a lot more processing power to handle the control algorithm. Um, so you have this input feedback coming, and you have to be able to compensate real time. And that math is... Uh, the Arduino can't def definitely not do it. Okay. So could a nice core i7 PC that's receiving really basic feedback data and it's processing yeah, it, on your big, huge, amazing laptop. I'm sure it could if it's real time. Uh, which wow. which you it could do wouldn't it, I, be I think, if it was Windows or Mac. Right. And so I think you could do it with an ARM. I think that's totally doable. Um, I don't think we've seen, or at least in my view, I haven't seen anything that anyone's attempted that. Or if they have, it hasn't been done very well. So, but I think maybe maybe way in the future for Gerbil that might be um, something that we can try. But uh, I think there's other more important things to to, to hack and all right, work what, on. What are the more important things to hack? Let's get in that. Um, just fleshing out all the feature sets. Really, I mean, it's like getting everything else ready, and then what, um, What's the number one feature, Sonny, that if you had a little bit more space? You would you would cram in there just like just incrementally more space. What what's the one thing that you know you just can't fit, but you would love to? Um, the full G code set. I don't have enough room to do a lot of the motion like the can cycle stuff like that. Um, yeah. Full on reporting like uh, there's some limitations in the speed of, of the thing. I can't I can't just give you the kitchen sink every time you hit. You know, a uh, ask for a query or a status report. Um, but you know, all that can be solved with ARM, and it's pretty easy. The whole thing is designed so that you can just extend right into and explode everything. It's, and it's, um, it should be very quick once we go pour it over. And Sonny has said uh, a couple of times on the the um, Garble uh, GitHub list. You know, this whole We're ARM Gerbil. conversation, Gerbil. GitHub list, uh, the issue tracker, this conversation has come up a bunch, and Sonny, I uh, commend you for this, doesn't want to jump on, you know, the latest and greatest. I, I think, and S Sonny, you can answer this, but you're basically waiting for, like, whatever the Uno version of the ARM Arduino is going to be, you know, just like the standard everyday Arduino ARM version, and then possibly moving over to the, to, uh, the, the ARM chip. Yeah, I think that's the general plan, but I don't know when it's going to happen. Um, I think at some point there has to be just a general decision and just, just move on. I mean, we're not fully out of room yet um, on the Uno, and there's some the feed rate override problem is uh, the next thing on the list. And as soon as that's done, I think I can reevaluate and uh, see where we can go from there. What you know? What I'd love to see is a buffer that's more than 128 bytes. <laughs> All you need is more memory. 
But I don't have any. But but the newer <laughs> Arduinos will have more, right? Because you know that flow control, oh, yeah. I would say, is the biggest challenge of doing something, uh, to, of doing the front end software of the G code sending. Yeah, and then you're piping it through USB, which is not really 100% um, uh, reliable at times. You know, I, I still say, and I'm just going to pat myself on the back real quick here. Like five well, hey, years That would ago. match your shirt, that you're awesome at being modest. So. Did you see that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you just, uh, you know, yeah, I love it. Thanks. I, I should actually send you one of these shirts, John, because I can, <laughs> I can see you rocking this, too. Um I made. I don't know if I could pull it off. I don't know. A long time ago, like <laughs> like garble 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 version, like maybe three or four. Uh, I had two Arduino set up. One of them with a with an SD card reader, and they were it was sending you know, TXRX. Um, so just talking about getting USB out of the way, I would say that was way more reliable than than USB. Wait, what was it doing? Just the so, so I called it a headless unit, even though it wasn't, because there was no like uh, visual feedback. But one Arduino had had uh, garble, garble, and garble, and the other Arduino had an SD shield on it that I would load a G code file on, and then as soon as you turned them on, they would handshake with the send and receive pins instead of over USB. I got just you. Like, that is kind of sweet. So you're saying that was just what? totally reliable doing that. You know, the, the, the way that I did it was there's actually a third wire. The Arduino with uh, Garble on it. Garble. Garble. Um, <laughs> <laughs> had, uh, basically, it was polling to see if the serial port was full. And if it was, then it, it basically went high on the other one, and it paused sending. And then once it went low, it would start sending again. So I mean, Sonny, what do you think about better ways to solve that? I mean, it, or, or or what you're saying is USB is not really reliable. I haven't found that USB fails. I thought USB was a, a guaranteed protocol, and that well, there's re, there's, re, there's packet retransmission if it gets messed up. Yeah, and I I think uh, my pro the problems I had when I first uh, was working on this uh, like well, was doing the X X on X off flow control software so flow control with uh, the serial port, and it wasn't working very well, and it kept on breaking for some reason, and I tracked it down to the USB packets not being sent on time. It, like, it, it tends to hold on to like, small amounts of data before sending it, uh, so that it reduces the, the you know, just collisions, I guess, or something. I don't know what, what it is in the, the USB protocol. And as soon as I cranked it up so I would send more data at a time, it started working again. And so that's kind of like how the whole, you send a whole line of G code and then you get an OK response started. And and that's, it seems like it works uh, at this point and I'd probably keep on working. And I don't know if what we can do is really improve it, per se, but um, I haven't really thought about it outside that. Yeah, I mean, because uh, I know what, what uh, Jarrett was saying on the Tiny G, or I'm sorry, on the Gerbil uh, version right now, is he's just... Sending it really slow to make it work because he's running into issues and it's it's buffer overflows. Um, and I know like Tiny G's done a lot of work to try and manage that flow control too. So it's just a huge challenge. And I think like Edward, what you're saying on SD card, most of the 3D print industry is just an SD card to get the data right next to the um, controller and yeah, not and deal with this flow control stuff. And that goes all the way back to, you know, uh, 30 minutes ago or whatever when we were talking about just modularity in the setup. Um, I, I would really like to see, I think that that's sort of what the Pi is doing um, or has a potential to do, you know, where, where you're basically eliminating USB. You've got this SD card that, that has the, the G-code file on it and you're sending it um, directly over to the Arduino uh, to be processed. Good. Through the I/O pins, on the RPI. Yeah. That so that is kind of cool. Um, but what about USB 3.0? I mean, my my laptop's got two USB 3.0 ports. Uh, Sunny, do you think that that's got anything better? Or? I have no idea. I haven't tested it. Is that partly why you were at 9600 baud on on Gerbil and you just recently moved to the 115,000? <laughs> um, it was because there were some stability issues in the really old versions. 
and uh, the last year and a half I've been working on fixing those stability issues, so you can just hammer the crap out of it. Um, so because because it was all working better and is basically robust, I, I think Rob told me from MeshCam he was running like programs of with 1.4 million lines of code, G code, and it was running like a champ, like several different programs. So um, I'm pretty happy to hear that. At 9600 baud or at the new at the no at the new the new 0.9 version at the new higher baud rate with the nice. new stability um, uh, fixes. What the heck is he doing? That's 115,000 lines of G code if it's not 3D printing, or is it 3D printing? It's no, uh, it's, it's, it's feature based machining, so they do like you know like uh, you know like a face or a skull, and they just end mill out the whole skull out of a piece of block. Ah, uh, okay, cool. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I'd love to. I'd love to see more stuff with lasers too, and all this, and that's just a lot of extra control. Although that's sort of, you know, probably not a USB serial port flow control problem. That's maybe back to Edward's point that you should have separate control units than some huge monolithic device. You know, I I just saw um, Sonny. I I don't, I don't know if you saw this, but there was a Kickstarter. Might still be running. Uh, somebody made a very simple. It's like HBot style. Um, it's got a one or two milliwatt laser on it. Um, I'm I'm pretty sure that they're using uh, Garble. 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 <laughs> I need a buzzer. No, I, I generally don't follow ah. much, much of anything these days, so. Um, I'll you check know it what, out. Edward? I think I know what you're talking about. Was it the guy in Australia that did it? Yeah, it was. That's the yeah, guy. Because did you see the laser video I posted? He's using the same laser, and it's this it's a blue diode laser. It's three watts. It's really an effective laser, um, and it's, uh, it's maybe like a $90 diode for three watts, and you can do a lot of good cutting with it. I'm pretty sure that, th that they're using Garble. Garble. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> they, they probably are, and you know what's funny is... I was asking Edward why more people aren't using Shapeocos for 3D printing. He didn't use a Shapeoco either. He did like a much lighter weight, like super yeah. simple. I don't even know if he used Maker Slide. I think yeah, he's just using. Yeah, you, know, you know, you basically don't have any lateral loads with a with a laser cutter, so you can be as light as you can get it, and so you can get faster rates. There's not enough. There's not a lot of mass inertia or anything like that. Yeah, no, you're right because when when you're moving your shape oak around, you're frankly moving a lot of metal atoms, like every move. And and mine's got so much stuff on it that I feel like I'm just weighing it down like crazy. <laughs> Mostly because Edward hasn't given us a quick release clip for the Z uh, axis yet. Probably probably not gonna <laughs> happen. <laughs> Come on, I'm dying for one. Laser blade. Laser blade. Yeah. What's laser blade? <laughs> that's the that's the Kickstarter five hundred and sixty nine thousand Australian. Okay. You, got, anyway. you see how much crap I got hanging off my seat? I need some quick release action. Holy cow! Yeah, I'm gonna push you on the on top of it. I got wires galore. I got I have like a touch probe I don't know, and I never want to like take it off because it's too hard. It's just turn it into a Frankenstein. That is a Frankenoko. <laughs> Edward, please help me. Could you do a Kickstarter? I'll I'll be the first one to participate. I'll like ten of them. I'll give them all my cousins as stocking stuffers for Christmas. I'm trying to figure out how much these guys just raised. Hold on a second, okay? Yeah, and but That's Sonny, you don't know if they're using the Gerbil um, for it. I'm. I'm sure that they are, and and uh, Sonny, I, I don't remember the guy's name, but he asked a whole bunch of questions, rapid fire, on the uh, the issue, on GitHub issues, and mm -hmm. then he was gone. <laughs> okay, that that makes sense then that he's probably doing it. Yeah, yeah. I think someone uh, pushed a uh, fix to convert Gerbil to run HBots at the time. Yeah. Yep. And then we also oh, we, uh, released it under the MIT license, so anybody can use it now in their products. Yeah, so man, that's, yeah, that's a lot of quid. 569. 
Huh. Yeah, because I actually I look at that too, and I'm like, you know, if you if you just go and buy the laser from DTR Laser Shop, it's like 130 bucks, and then you just throw it on a Shape Oco. Although when you do the Shape Oco, what's the price now, Edward? It's 300 bucks. Um, for the mechanical, yeah, I, I think it's 650 for the for the full kit. Yeah, which means it really actually is more expensive now. So his price isn't bad. That's a pretty cool machine. Well, yeah, that laser. Somebody should share the screen and show everybody what we're talking about. It's Here, I'll do it. Good looking. Yeah, you do it. Um, That's a machine. Uh, what's it called again? Laser uh, blade. Yep. Laser blade. Go. With a Z or an S? Z. Z. Like of laser. Course. Of course, laser with a Z. Crazy awesome policies. <laughs> Laser blade. Yeah, that's pretty good, actually. Well, what's the exchange yeah. rate on Australian dollars right now? 91, uh, 91 cents. Okay, so it's about the same. Yeah, I actually really like how lightweight it is. That's not a lot of metal to be moving around. No. I'll tell you the part that I don't like about it, and this is totally honest. It looks really dangerous. <laughs> think so? Yeah. Why, because of the laser? Yeah, like I feel like at minimum they need a sticker on the front that says "Do not look at laser with one remaining eye." <laughs> yeah, you know it's funny because I do a lot of stuff with lasers and I do get really scared. If I've been working all day on lasers, my eyes actually do hurt at the end of the day, and I'm like, "Oh my god, you do not get another set of eyeballs." You 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 really don't. I I like what he's got here um, with this printed 3D um, stuff because. You know, the laser is probably up at where that cone is that it's smallest. Mm -hmm. I think he's pushing air through there, too, to clear away the smoke because it'll, it'll mess up your lens. So he yeah. did a really nice job on that little custom piece. I also, with this laser, found that it's got about a 40-millimeter focal length. So he, that looks about right. He may only have it on when it's close to the thing you're cutting, uh, Edward, to sort of avoid... The scattering to your eyes. Maybe. So um, yeah, he so I he does have air flow. The, the sweet part about the the um, campaign. So the the machine is you know I mean it's clever, but I've seen a bunch uh, <laughs> sim similar to that. He he's got some software. Pick laser light um, by a guy named John, who's actually Shapeoko owner, who I think used his Shapeoko uses his Shapeoko in the same manner as this laser blade. Um, pick laser light, it, it's uh, so like that? image image to um, G-code. Pick laser light. What is it, uh, P-I-C-K? P-I-C-L-A-S-E-R -I -I -E dash light, L-I-T-E. Oh, L-I-T-E, yeah, pick laser light, all one word. Yeah, I... Laser Light Australia? Is that maybe it? Pick Laser Light. No. I'm just looking through I know that. what you're talking about, but I thought he was more of a software company. Um, well, he, yeah, just, uh, John just did the software for it, just the Pick Laser Light. I, I'm not sure who's doing the, the hardware. Oh, okay. um, yeah. I just thought that that package itself was, like, pretty straightforward, you know? Here's an image file. Uh, let me generate some G code that'll work with a with a laser diode strapped to basically any XY platform. Right. Okay, oh yeah, right, Pick Laser Light comes with yeah. um, yep. this uh, Kickstarter. Yeah, I think it's sweet. Yeah, I interesting. Mean, you know, I look at this and think this should have been a web app, not a... Um, well, obviously you did. Yeah. Not a desktop app, because who does those anymore? And, and then, you know, had Chili Pepper been around, maybe um, these guys... The, the laser with a Z guys would have um, done sort of a, a branch, like a workspace for the laser blade. My only concern with chili pepper, and we started talking about this last time a little bit, is it's it's a whole lot of stuff, John. And it doesn't seem very like straightforward how one could go about starting to use it. Um so it would be really nice. Maybe maybe you need to do a, a video walkthrough or something. Just like, hey, here's your shape, Oko. Here's chili pepper. This is how you get started. 
Because even after seeing it now for like two or three weeks, I'm still sort of like, oh man, I don't know about that. It looks scary. It looks I'm hard. Scary, yeah. But you know, have, it looks hard. Uh, and I've got some walkthroughs going, um, so maybe you just haven't checked them out. But you know, I guess what I would say to that, Edward, is that if if I'm doing this Kickstarter for Laser Blade, and I want to do custom software, am I gonna go fork Universal G Code Sender, the Java app? And then you know, try and make my own compiled version and my own installers, or am I going to go write something totally from scratch, or am I going to go try and you know do something else? And so I feel like none of it's that easy, but is this the easiest? Maybe. So I'm not I'm sure. But what I would say is uh, Jarrett Lufts, who did the Gerbil. Uh, fork, uh, pulled it off in a weekend. Yeah. So, you know, that's that's encouraging to me. Agreed. Agreed. Sonny, has anybody contributed to the um, the Gerbil code base easily, or do you find that most people just they'll, they'll participate in the forums, but they're not really writing code and pushing it to you? Um, the vast majority, they don't write code or push it to me. There's occasion occasionally there are a few, um, but the level like the how good of a code it is varies like tremendously. Usually it's not very good. So I mean I think Edward that sort of maybe validates a little bit that like getting people to contribute to projects and modify is enormously unsuccessful out there. Yeah, um, and the whole <laughs> problem is like forking. Like everyone forks things and no one like reintegrates. You know the fixes that all these different people do, and it's impossible to like get everything synchronized. So everyone's right. like, you know, making something good. Right. Exactly. And then even somebody forking a, a web project and then launching their own web server and a new domain name and you know go find a place to host it. That's so much extra work to do. You just don't get it. And so if you can just make that as simple as clicking a button, that changes the game. And I think that's why, like, GitHub, we all rally around it. But, um, you know, Edward, how I refer to you as the Linus Torvalds of the CNC world. Thanks Linus, again for that plug. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm going to repeat it in every video we do. But awesome. Linus Torvalds even sort of, you know, he helped, he, he sort of invented Git. And what a lot of people have said is that GitHub's amazing, but it actually stopped all the contribution. <laughs> so... <laughs> You know, it's it's tough. So it's not Sonny, I'm not surprised to hear that you're not necessarily getting people pushing updates to you. It's just a brutal thing about open source software. Part of the problem is, is probably just the, uh, you know, for like a weekend hacker type, it's probably intimidating. You think, well, my code's not probably up to snuff or, you know, think of a hundred different reasons why, well, they're never going to accept this push anyway, so I'm not going to figure out how to do it or pull request. Um, well, I did a I did a fork of Universal G Code Center a long time ago. In fact, um, remember Edward, I put it up on the Shape Oko wiki. Yeah. Uh, to get it to work with Tiny G, because I was just so desperate to do Tiny G. I'm like, wait, I just got this awesome device, and there's nothing out there. TG Effects didn't even wasn't even in existence yet. I'm yeah. like, why did I buy this? I can't even use it. So I forked it, and I it, it totally worked for me for a lot of jobs. I pushed the changes via GitHub to. Wait, um, weren't you just supposed to use the real term, or? Cool, uh, cool term. term. Yeah. Great. That sounds like fun. Uh, no thanks. But yes, I could have done that. Okay. Uh, but that's just that's awful. So, I mean, good luck jogging in cool term. <laughs> <laughs> so I pushed the changes to um, the the guy, the maintainer, and he just wouldn't accept them because it, it wasn't sort of the way he had done it. So I'm like, well. All right, no, no tiny G support in Universal G Code Center, and still to this date, there's no support, as far as I know. Yeah. So it's just brutal. Um, so I hear you on some of the. It's it's intimidating, but we'll just keep making these videos, and I'll just you know eventually get you to come around. <laughs> come are you come guys... around to, to to Chili Pepper, or come around to Tiny G? Uh, Chili Pepper. I know you'll never come around to Tiny G. I don't know. I like simple. I think that uh, that Garble, Gerbil, Gerbil, Gerbil <laughs> uh, is is more in line with you know the this sort of Shapeoko core philosophy. Just like do do one thing, 
do it based on constraints, do it, do it really well. Yeah, I, I hear you, although, you know, it's funny going between the two uh, in the last couple of days. Acceleration stuff. Although you know what, I'm running the old firmware, Sonny. So I don't know. Yeah, I, I think give, you put a lot of work. Point on. Nine. Get point nine. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna do it. Okay, okay, I gotta get going here, you guys. We've been on here for maybe an hour, so that's pretty good. Actually, I think an hour and fifteen. Ooh. Yeah. So uh, it is pretty good. All right. Well, it was good hanging out with you guys. Yeah, yeah likewise. Great hanging out with you too, Sonny. Really great to meet you here for the first time. Uh, yeah. Love your work. Thank you. I think that the world owes you lots of, uh, you know, credit back and pats on the back. So thank <laughs> Thanks. you Agreed. for all of that. And and Edward, of course, thank you for all of your brilliance. Yeah. Thanks, Lionel. You know, yeah. I I do what I can, guys. I'm just one one man. Yeah. That that's right. But but you feel like ten. <laughs> all right. I'll see you guys later. Take care. Okay. All right. Take it easy, guys. All right.